Good morning, everyone. It's great to see everybody here today. Wonderful to commune with each other and have fellowship with each other, especially for me, so people can remind me, hey, aren't you supposed to be up there uh, doing welcome? And what do you know? They're right. So it's wonderful to see everybody here today. If you'll take a look at your bulletins, there are several announcements. I'll let you read through those, one with salt. Coming up, uh, you ladies would wish to attend that. Also for you ladies, uh, a bridal shower for Macy Owen today. Um, her wedding is coming up real soon, so great to hear that. Operation Christmas, Christmas Child, uh, it's coming up really quickly, so pay attention to that. And if you need a shoebox, we've got some over here. Uh, if you have any questions about that, uh, you can ask um, Don or Dick or Joyce if they're here. Or, um, one of our leaders or elders can point you in the right direction. Let's go ahead and pray as we open up our service today. Father God, we come before you today with a heart of worship and of praise. We thank you so much for this life that you give us, the hope that you give us through your son, Jesus Christ, that one day you will call us home, that we will be in your presence, and we just wait with great anticipation for that day. Lord, we just we ask that you will be with us here today as we worship you and honor you. We thank you for everyone that's here, that their eyes will be open, that their ears will be open, and that our hearts will compel us to go out and reach others, Lord. Lord, we pray this all in your name. Amen.
Before we go to prayer, I have a couple prayer requests to add to your prayer list. I continue to want to pray for our, our country and our nation and keep praying for all the conflict that's going on in the world right now. Um, we have a couple surgeries going on on Thursday. Ben didn't say I can say this, but Ben's having hand surgery. Ben's having hand surgery on Thursday, so keep him in prayer. And Bob Kinderman is having shoulder surgery on Thursday, so please keep Bob in prayer too. Um, Dick and Joyce Sims are not here today, as you can see. They are in Texas. They are looking for a place to live because the place they were going to live that did not fall through, so keep them in prayer that they can find the right place to move to and be close to family down there. Um, please keep Dave Hancock and Linda Zimmers in prayer as they're recovering from their surgeries that they had over the last couple of weeks. So before we go to the Lord in prayer, Psalms 57, 9 and through 11, I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples for great is your love reach for great is your love reaching to the heavens your faithfulness reaches to the sky be exalted O God above the heavens let your glory be over all the earth let us go to prayer father God Lord almighty we want to praise you today we want to be like the song says father better is one day in your court Father, let our focus be on you. Set aside the distractions, set aside everything in, in this world, Father, that we can truly praise and worship and give you the glory today. Father, be with our nation. Father, help us to know what to do and, and see your hand at work. Be with our country, Father, our military and, our, and everything, Father. Be with the election that is coming up and the right person will get in the office. Father, we do pray for Ben as he's having hand surgery coming up on Thursday, for Bob as he's having shoulder surgery, that you'll be with both of them, that the recovery will go quickly, that, that um, they won't be in a lot of pain, be with the doctors and give them the wisdom of exactly what needs to happen. Uh, Father, we do lift up Dick and Joyce, Father, that they'll find the place that you want them to find. And Father, that they'll be able to move close to um, family down in Texas. Father, we do pray for um, Linda Zimmers and Dave Hancock as they're recovering from the surgeries that they have. Just heal them and mend them. Father, as we pray for this service, that we'll glorify you, that we'll honor you, and that we'll come to you because we know that you are the great I am, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Father, we just praise you for sending us your Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and rose again for our sins. And Father, that we may have salvation through Christ and through Christ alone. Father, let us our focus be truly on you today. In Jesus' name, amen.
Scripture reading is Psalm 91. The first part of this verse is, whoever, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, but whoever makes it personal. I'm gonna try to make this personal. Um, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord, who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves you, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him. For he will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Kids, you can take off if you're here to go with Pastor Don to Children's Church. Take a moment and pray. Lord, in your word you say that all flesh is like grass and all of its glory is like the flower of the field. Grass withers, the flower falls, but your word, O Lord, remains forever. And so we are investing ourselves in what is eternal this morning. Would you plant that seed of truth into our hearts so that it would grow and flourish and impact our lives by your grace, for your glory, I pray. Amen. What are some of the safest places in the world that you can think of? Here are some places that I looked up this week. Uh, There's some places in the United States that are safe places, and there are places across the Atlantic that I saw as well that are safe places. There's Fort Knox, which is, of course, our nation's gold reserves. And uh, that's, of course, one of the safest places for your gold, if that's um, what you're worried about. Or there's Cheyenne Mountain Complex that's over in Colorado. That's a military bunker that's built inside of a mountain. It's designed to withstand nuclear attacks and other major threats or catastrophes. Across the Atlantic in Norway, there's a place called the Svalbard Global Seed Vault that can withstand global catastrophes. It provides long-term storage for duplicates of seeds from around the world, so it provides security for our food supply around the world against the loss of seeds. Maybe it's due to, to war or to sabotage, to disease or natural disasters or some uh, apocalyptic event that would happen. 
Then in Switzerland, of course, there's the Swiss banks for the 1% who uh, send their offshore accounting that way, and it's incredibly safe for storing wealth and valuables. Why do such places have to exist in our world today? It's because there's a universal human desire for safety and for the prolonging of human life. Whether it's safety from physical harm or financial ruin or emotional pain and insecurity or whatever you want safety from, people are searching for safety. People are longing to live longer. But despite our best efforts as humans to do this for ourselves, whether it's through storing up our money, saving up for the future, maybe it's relationships, the people that we're investing in that kind of give us a sense of security in our lives, or maybe it's even fortified places we would run to in case of a, a, a catastrophe. Life still remains fragile, and life in this world still remains unpredictable. We're living in an increasingly chaotic world where natural disasters, where violence or personal tragedies strike us without a moment's notice, without warning. Where can we truly be safe? And that's what Psalm 91 answers for us. Shockingly, Psalm 91 claims that the safest place for us to be is in a shadow of all places. Normally, when you think of a shadow, it's not a safe place, is it? Unless you consider what or who is casting the shadow. Think, for instance, between the difference between a bunny's shadow and a mama bear's shadow. Whose shadow is safer? Or think, for instance, of a shrub versus a mountain's shadow. Which shadow is safer? Well, in Psalm 91, the safest place to be is in the shadow of Shaddai. That Hebrew name for God, Shaddai, could be rooted in one of two words, either a word for mountain, so that's why I use the illustration of a mountain's shadow, and that's the illustration behind me is of a mountain. But the other word that we get it from too, or it could be from, is the word for strength or power, hence the name Almighty in our English translations. This name for God, Shaddai, it appears the most times in the two earliest books we have chronologically in our Bibles, Genesis and Job. In Genesis, whenever Shaddai is used, it suggests that God is at his most powerful when his covenant people are at their most vulnerable. Elihu in Job, Elihu is the friend who comes along much later. He's sitting at a distance, and then finally at the end, he comes in and he starts giving his two cents on the matter. And this is what he says to Job in his suffering. Shaddai, he is great in power. And that's why we translate it as almighty, great in strength and power. Shaddai is a name for God that cuts every threat we face down to size. To even dwell in Shaddai's shadow alone is to be in the safest place in all the universe. This shadow suggests three things according to Psalm 91 as we listen to it being read by Ben. First, it suggests divine presence. Divine presence, dwelling in the shadow of Shaddai, represents being near to God, where he's casting his shadow. Just as a shadow cannot exist without the presence of something solid nearby, our safety is inseparable from God's closeness and our nearness to him. Second, Shaddai's shadow also suggests divine protection. That's what this entire psalm is really about. It's about God's protection. In the Middle Eastern heat, Shadows would offer relief to weary travelers or protection from the elements. Think of the, the wind that's blowing hard or the, the scorching sun above. We have a hint in verse 4 of Psalm 91 as to what is casting this shadow from God. It's God's pinions, the feathers, or his wings. Now, that's a zoomorphism. It's attributing to God animal parts. Obviously, we understand that God doesn't literally have wings. At least, I hope you understand that he doesn't literally have wings. It's a figure of speech to help us envision what is true of God here. And the original audience would have envisioned two images related to these wings. One possibility that they would have envisioned was the cherubim's wings that are overshadowing the mercy seat in the Ark of the Holy of Holies. That's where God's presence dwelt in the tabernacle and then later in the temple. So those wings are overshadowing the ark. And we see this in Exodus 37, verse 9. The cherubim spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, with their faces one to another. Toward the mercy seat were the faces of the cherubim. So once a year, on the Day of Atonement, 
the high priest would enter that holy of holies and sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice for atonement on that mercy seat, representing that Israel's sins have now been atoned for by that sacrifice, and that God in his mercy is forgiving his people by the merit of the blood of that sacrifice. So the image of the wings of the cherubim might have reminded Israel in Psalm 91 of God's protecting mercy from his wrath against their sin. Those in Christ, us today, have the same merciful protection, dwelling under the shelter and the shadow of his wings. The writer of Hebrews says that the blood of Christ purifies us and sprinkles our heart clean from all of our sin. And the blood and sacrifice of Christ is far superior to the blood of animals, the sacrifices of bulls and goats. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ once for all. Another image that might have popped into the original audience's minds as they're reading is maybe they're reminded of when God had covered and carried his people in the wilderness for 40 years until they entered the promised land. We read this in Deuteronomy 32 verses 11 to 12. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions, the Lord alone guided him. That is Israel. No foreign God was with him. So we might also imagine um, just how God has protected Israel over those 40 years in the wilderness until they entered into the promised land and were rooted there just as God had promised. We could also imagine the wings of a mother bird or a mother hen. Like in the New Testament, we get this image of of Jesus promising to uh, gather in God's people in Jerusalem to protect them from the circling hawk overhead, for instance. This is what Jesus desired for Jerusalem. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. How sad. Jesus is extending his protection, his salvation to his people and they will not have it. They won't run under his wings and be saved. All this is to show that under the shadow of God's wing, his children are safe. Under the shadow of God's wing, we have refuge from the harsh elements of this fallen world that we're living in deadly pestilence and plague. The shadow of his wings relieves our fears about the attacks of enemies, the psalmist says in Psalm 91, the arrows of Satan that he shoots at us, or maybe the the legions of demons that he would send to assault us. However, we need to remember something in context here, that Satan uses this very psalm to tempt Jesus in the wilderness. He takes him to the top of the temple, and he tempts him to jump off, and then he quotes this psalm saying, God's going to send his angels your foot's not going to touch a stone. And Jesus sees right through it. And he says to Satan as he's twisting God's word, and Jesus says, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So Jesus understood that God doesn't promise in Psalm 91 to deliver us from every evil in this life all the time. Psalm 91 doesn't give us permission to presume upon God's power to live recklessly and to jump off of tall buildings and say, well, God's going to rescue me, or to assume that we're never going to be hurt, that we're never going to be sick, that we're never going to experience death in this life. Obviously, we know the human experience tells us otherwise. Rather, this psalm, Psalm 91, is assuring us that when we live in the shadow of Shaddai, our lives may be threatened, but the life that is really life can never be threatened. This truth is seen in Elizabeth Elliot's biography of her murdered missionary husband to the Hurani people in Ecuador, Jim Elliot, back in the 50s. Elizabeth Elliot titled Jim's biography, The Shadow of the Almighty, taken from that first verse in Psalm 91. We know that Jim died by being pierced by a spear. How do we reckon that with verse 5 in Psalm 91? The psalmist could have well said of Jim, you will not fear the terror of night nor the spear that flies by day, and yet that's exactly how he dies. Here's how we reconcile it. Jim Elliot gave his life for the gospel, but nobody could ever touch the life that is really life within him. Jim Elliot famously wrote in his diary, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Here's what Jim meant by that, and Elizabeth Elliot 
uh, hints at that towards the end of her biography. In God's good providence, the candle of your life can be snuffed out in this world, but the fire of eternal life can never be extinguished. It will keep burning forever. Or as Jesus puts it in the Gospels, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. Jim didn't lose his life. He gained it. So Psalm 91 doesn't mean nothing will ever go wrong in your life, that you'll never be sick, that you'll never get COVID, that you'll never be afraid or scared or alone, that you'll be invincible to man's attacks or to Satan's attacks, that you can walk on hot coals or pick up serpents in your hand and never get bitten and poisoned. That's not what this psalm is about. Psalm 91 assures us that God's preservation and protection of us mean so much more than just mere physical safety. We have eternal safety and security in Shaddai's shadow. So this shadow in this psalm suggests, number one, divine presence, number two, divine protection, and then thirdly, divine provision, divine provision. God's shadow provides us with some glorious gifts. If you look at the the last half of this psalm in verse 13, one of the glorious gifts of divine provision in this shadow of the Almighty is victory over our deadly enemies. The mention of the lion and the cobra or the the adder and the the serpent, it's probably not meant to be taken literally. Don't go out into the wild attempting to slay a mountain lion with your bare foot or to crush a cobra. Treading on and trampling underfoot the lion and the serpent reminds us of the gospel promise all the way back in Genesis and as you trace it throughout uh, the whole scriptures. In scripture, Satan is likened to a prowling and roaring lion, 1 Peter 5, 8. He's that ancient serpent from the garden in Genesis 3. And while Jesus is the promised seed of the woman in Genesis 3.15 who crushes the serpent at the cross, God also extends that promise to the saints. And he says in Romans chapter 16 verse 20 that under our feet, soon he will crush Satan under our feet. So one day God is going to give us ultimate success once and for all over Satan, our great enemy. We are going to share in Christ's final victory forever in the defeat of Satan. Another glorious gift that that God provides in his shadow is answered prayer. That's in verse 15, the first half of verse 15. We know that dialing the number 911 is going to get us into touch with emergency help. Three numbers can do it all for you. Often, though, the situations that we face in life can't be remedied by human first responders. Many times our crisis requires divine assistance. And when that happens, we're to be calling a different kind of 911. We're to be calling Psalm 91.1. There we find the help, the protection of our Almighty God. God promises to be our first responder in times of trouble when human hands can't help. In the second half of verse 15, we see that God also provides honor to us when we abide in his shadow. Graciously, God promises to exalt, to highly esteem, to bestow rewards upon those who are abiding in his shadow, who are taking shelter in the Most High. And we see ultimately that this great reward that he's going to honor us with is really in the last verse of the psalm. Psalm 91 verse 16, he's going to honor us with long life. He's going to satisfy us with long life, the psalmist says. Typically in the Old Testament, that phrase speaks of God promising to extend a person's physical life. Uh, Literally, it could be translated, length of days will be added to you. Um, So consider, for instance, what God promises Solomon in 1 Kings 3.14. Solomon is praying for wisdom, and God says this, If you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. Same phrase at the end there. I will prolong your life. You will live long and you will prosper. But David in Psalm 21 verse 4 seems to use this phrase as a synonym for eternal life. So God promises Solomon, live like your father David. And this is what David says in Psalm 21. The king asked life of you. You gave it to him. Length of days forever endeavor. That's much, much more than just saying, I'm going to have a long and fulfilled life on this earth. This is something much, much more, much, much longer. So how else could we make sense of this promise that Shaddai is going to satisfy us with a long life when so many Christians are cut down in their prime? Jim Elliott, he was only 28. Jonathan Edwards was 55 when he died of smallpox. 
Charles Spurgeon was 57. Eric Ream was 50. While God may be pleased to extend your physical life, ultimately the reward that he bestows upon those who are abiding in his shadow is everlasting life, a life that can never be threatened, a life that can never be touched, a life that can never be taken away. We don't merely need physical safety in this life. We need eternal safety. And so by staying in Shaddai's shadow, we're under his wings, we're under his care. He's carrying us and he's caring for us. And ultimately, he provides us with eternal safety. And that's what we're looking at this morning. Stay in Shaddai's shadow to be eternally safe. So what does it mean for us to stay in Shaddai's shadow? What does it look like for us? What does it look like for you to abide in the shadow of the Almighty? The first and the last stanzas of this psalm really supply four answers for us. Throughout this psalm, it's kind of like a a call and response that would have taken place in worship at the temple. We don't know who wrote this psalm. We don't know the occasion for this psalm, but we know that it would have been used in worship as a kind of call and response. And in the first stanza, you've kind of got the general call. And then in verse 2, you've got the specific uh, where maybe the the congregation is, is claiming truths about God for themselves. And then you've got kind of an interlude in the middle where maybe the the leader in worship is saying this is what's true. And then at the very end, in the last stanza, you have God speaking to the congregation. And so in the first and in the last stanza, you've got four answers to what it means for us to stay in Shaddai's shadow. The first thing it means for us to stay in in Shaddai's shadow is permanent residence. Permanent residence. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Verse 9, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. So the psalmist doesn't say that everyone who occasionally seeks refuge in in God is going to be safe. Visitors aren't safe. Should I shadow isn't like someone else's house that you visit for lunch after church and then you leave after the meal to go back home. Vacationers aren't safe. Should I shadow isn't a nice cabin on a lake in Minnesota or a ski resort in Colorado that you just spend a weekend at. The psalmist says only dwellers are safe. Two times the psalmist stresses that verb for, uh, or the noun form, in verse 1 and in verse 9. The verb is in verse 1, the noun is in verse 9. Alec Matir translates verse 1 as, whoever makes his home in the covering of the Most High, in the shadow of Shaddai, finds his lodging. And then the noun in verse uh, verse 9, rather, means a place where people live more than temporarily. So dwelling implies this permanent residence, a place where you're settling down, a place where you're living every day, not just occasionally. We can't expect eternal safety from a God that we only visit occasionally on weekends or vacation to on special holidays like Christmas and Easter. Spurgeon preached this to his congregation, the shadow of God is not the occasional resort, but the constant abiding place of the saint. Here we find not only our consolation, but our habitation. Not only a loved haunt, but a home. We ought never to be out of the shadow of God. It is to dwellers, not to visitors, that the Lord promises his protection. So this is the heart of Psalm 91's promise of protection. We need to stay in Shaddai's shadow to experience his eternal safety. So live in it. Make it your home. Put down your roots there and don't move out. Stay in Shaddai's shadow by taking up permanent residence. Be a dweller, not merely a visitor or a vacationer. Second, stay in Shaddai's shadow means possessive trust, not positive trust, possessive trust. Verse 2 says, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. The psalmist doesn't just state some facts about the Lord being a refuge, about the Lord being a fortress, about the Lord being the true God of all the universe. He possesses those facts by faith. Look at the personal pronouns. He says, the Lord is my refuge. He is my refuge fortress. He is my God in whom I trust. That's personal. He's applying it to himself. It's one thing to profess that the Lord is those things, a refuge, a fortress, and the true God. As true as those facts may be, we can't just merely profess those things. You need to take ownership of those facts with faith and trust in him daily as those for yourself. 
To stay in his shadow, you need to trust him, not as a distant deity far off, but as your personal protector and provider who's always near, near enough to cast his shadow upon you. Ask yourself, is God your refuge and fortress, or is he merely a backup plan in time of need? Is God really your God? Make an intentional decision today to put your trust fully in him, not just when life is getting hard, but every day, rain or sunshine. Thirdly, we stay in Shaddai's safe shadow through persevering love. Persevering love. This is down in the last stanza of the psalm, verse 14. Because, this is God speaking, because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. God is promising deliverance to those who are holding fast to him in love. The Hebrew word there for hold fast to him in love, it's all one word, and it carries the meaning of setting your heart on someone with unshakable devotion. Maybe that's how your translation renders that phrase, because he sets his heart on me. It can mean to attach yourself to or to join yourself to or together with someone. It's the same word that is used in Deuteronomy 7-7, where God says he has set his love forever on his people, but not because his people deserved it. He loves his people because he chooses to love them. Likewise, our love for God must be persevering, a love that clings to him no matter what, except in God's case, God deserves our love. He desires our love. He demands our love. Staying in his shadow means developing this enduring love that's going to hold fast to him even through our trials. Paul memorably describes love this way in the great love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, 7. He says, love endures all things. So that's to say true love keeps going. It persists. It remains steadfast. It perseveres through problems, through pains, and through every plight that we face. Evaluate your love for God today. Is it circumstantial, dependent on things going well in your life? Or is it enduring, holding fast to him no matter what is going on in your life? God promises you that nothing will separate you from his love. That's Romans 8. He loves his own with a steadfast, everlasting love. So therefore, let nothing separate God from your love. To stay in his safe shadow, hold fast to the Almighty. Hold fast to Shaddai in love. And then fourthly and finally, staying safe in Shaddai's shadow means personal knowledge. Personal knowledge. That's in the second half of verse 14. God says, I will protect him because he knows my name. Knowing God's name goes far beyond than just knowing about him and what he's called. It's not just theoretical and cognitive understanding, although that is the foundation. That's how you have this part of knowledge that you need, is to have some kind of idea of who God is as he reveals himself. But knowing God needs to go beyond just knowing the facts. It needs to be personal. It needs to be relational. It needs to be intimate. This kind of knowledge that the psalmist is writing down here as God is speaking is the kind of knowledge that implies fellowship and communion with God. Knowing God's name means that you're well acquainted with his reputation. You've entered into this intimate covenant relationship with him. And this covenantal knowledge ultimately leads to everlasting life. Listen to what Jesus prayed on the night when he's going to be betrayed. He prays this in John 17, verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So here's the only math equation that ever matters in your life, that you ever need to figure out. It's on the final exam. Eternal life equals knowing God the Father plus knowing God the Son, whom he has sent, Jesus Christ. If you want eternal safety... You need to know the Father and the Son savingly, intimately, personally, covenantally. How can you know God this way? Thankfully, Jesus keeps going in this prayer. Verse 6, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. So let me put that in the language of what we're seeing in Psalm 91. God will protect you. Because you know his name, which has been revealed to you only by Jesus Christ. Jesus is the perfect representation of the Father. He's the exact imprint of his nature, the writer of the Hebrews says in Hebrews 1. If knowing God's name means knowing his nature, then to know his nature, you ultimately need to see him through the lens of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. 
Jesus would tell his disciples earlier that same evening in John 14, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the father and it's enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? There's so many people, even professing Christians, who wrongly believe in a false trinity. They read the Old Testament, they say, well, the Father is angry all the time, he's full of wrath at his people, and he's inaccessible to most everyone. And then you go to the New Testament, and they, and they read, Jesus is loving all the time, he's full of grace for everyone, he's welcoming to everyone. But they get it all wrong. Somehow and somewhere down the line, people get the notion that the Father is less inclined to love and forgive them than Jesus is. That couldn't be more false in all the scriptures, when you look at it together as a whole. After all, who is it that sent the Son into the world to save the world out of love? Was it not God the Father in John 3.16? The Father appointed salvation, the Son accomplished salvation, the Spirit applies salvation, that's what Ephesians chapter 1 shows us. The Trinity is working together. They all have the same heart for mankind. So whatever we see in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, in the Gospels is a perfect reflection or expression, manifestation of God the Father for us. In other words, in Jesus, you can see the Father's heart in the flesh for you as you read the Gospels. If you know Jesus, you know the Father. If you don't know Jesus, you cannot know the Father. J.I. Packer explains what knowing God involves in case you're wondering, what does it mean to to know God? What does that look like for me in my life? And so in his seminal work, Knowing God, this is what J.I. Packer says, knowing God involves first listening to God's word and receiving it as the Holy Spirit interprets it in application to oneself. Second, noting God's nature and character as his word and works reveal. Third, accepting his invitations and doing what he commands. Fourth, recognizing and rejoicing in the love that he has shown and thus approaching you and drawing you into his divine fellowship. And then a little bit later on, he adds, knowing God is a matter of personal involvement, mind, will, and feeling. It would not indeed be a fully personal relationship otherwise. To get to know another person, you have to commit yourself to his company and his interests and be ready to identify yourself with his concerns. Without this, Your relationship with him can only be superficial and flavorless. So if you want an actual, genuine, and flavorful relationship with God, you've got to know him in an intimate way through Jesus Christ. And so I ask you this morning, do you know God this way through God the Son? To know God this way is to abide in his safe shadow and to receive eternal life from his hand and the full benefits that come along with salvation. The shadow of Shaddai, it's the safest place to be. How can you be eternally safe in Shaddai's shadow? Reside in him continually and permanently. Don't move out of it. Trust in him for yourself personally as your refuge, your fortress, your God. Hold fast to him in love, a love that will endure all things. And know him personally, know him intimately, relationally, covenantly, savingly through Jesus Christ. To stay in Shaddai's shadow is to be satisfied with the long life that only the Almighty could ever offer. This is life that can't be threatened, that can't be touched, that can't be taken away. This life is really life. This is eternal and everlasting life. And it comes only by living in the shelter of the Most High, by making him your dwelling place today and always through Jesus Christ alone. Stay in Shaddai's shadow to be eternally safe. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that we would heed this psalm as the psalmist reflects on your goodness, your grace, your greatness even in the name Shaddai, that you are almighty Everything else pales in comparison. All of the threats on our lives are cut down to size by the name Almighty. So, Lord, I pray that we would take refuge in your shadow, for it is the safest place. Lord, we run to the cross today, and we take shelter from 
wrath for our sin that we deserve, and instead we receive mercy that we don't deserve, but that Christ has merited for us by his blood. Oh Lord, help us to live all of our days such that if you call us to be a Jim Elliott in this life, or an Eric Ream in this life, or a Charles Spurgeon, or a Jonathan Edwards, whatever life you would call us to be and to commit ourselves to, help us to have life that is truly life, a life that is eternal because we are dwelling in your shadow. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's still stuff up here on the organ bench. There's a lot of information there for the Operation Christmas Child Shoebox stuff. There's also the new study guide for this psalm, if you're using that for small groups or individually throughout the week. And we do have a time of fellowship downstairs, so if you would join us for that. And then, of course, next week, join us for the celebration of our 50th anniversary here as a church to see how God has blessed this church and is using this church and what we look forward to in the future. And now may the Lord Most High shelter you under his wings. Because you love him, may he deliver you mightily. Because you know him through Christ, may he protect you fully. When you call out to him, may he answer you swiftly. When you're in trouble, may he be with you continually. Because you abide under his shadow, may he satisfy you with life eternal, so that his name will be exalted forever on the earth. Amen and amen.